I'm, um, I have a lecture from 12 to 2, and I've got another one from 4 to 6, so I can't stay around. But I think um, it is a time where there's a lot more technology and a lot more AI applications going into the mining resources industry, so it might be something that you're interested in looking at some of the courses that we have available at Curtin. Not only in terms of what you might study, but in terms of what sort of things, what sort of graduates you might be interested in having on in, uh, in your operations. So it's a course that started in 2017. We have our first students came through this year. We, uh, last year we've got another cohort going through. So they, um, it's a two year master's course, but we also had the grad cert, which is one semester, graduate diploma, which is two semesters and then two full years full time for the masters. Uh, there's a common first year. We have multiple streams, but they go through the common first year, so they uh, they have a choice at the end of that first year as to which stream they go into. So what we are looking at was an industry need to have more people uh, have skill sets that weren't necessarily part of their undergraduate courses. So you might have an engineering degree, you might have a computing degree, you might have a business degree but all of them seem to be having that need for an analytics on top of it. So data analytics and then predictive analytics so we can start to see, put all these sensors on our, all of our equipment across our plant perhaps. We've got outside information coming in, we want to put that together and be able to not only understand what's been happening, but also have an idea of what might happen next. What sort of things do we have to look out for going forward? So, something like this. So looking at the Internet of Things, which is another um, course that you might be interested in. So we have a MicroMasters, an online course that you can do in the Internet of Things. And that's looking at putting sensors, putting, um, having access to data off a lot of different resources across the system. So in this case, it's across three buses in a network. And then being able to take that data, collect that data, maybe display it in this case. So you've got the, three, the four buses here. Each of them you have the fuel gauges and what their current speeds are. You can graph that all together, bring all that data onto a dashboard and be able to plot it. So we've um, had also our first sort of graduates going through that online course which we presented to them yesterday. And once you have all of that information, being able to um, take the data and apply machine learning techniques, apply artificial intelligence to get some sort of pattern, some sort of reasoning, some sort of predictions out of what you have there. So with any of the sensors that we have out in the field, you might have <coughs> options to be able to just get the telemetry, get the data off them. Maybe um, the device sends a request through, you may actually be asking the device to do something for you. And then having that um, option from the desktop, from a workstation to be able to control and view all of that data across your network, across your system is really useful. There's a lot, a lot of power in that. So for actual operations, but also being able to understand and optimise your uh, processing. And also combined data sets, so we have uh, perhaps some sensors in a workplace, but also the data coming, in this case for weather, being able to look at the, the, the external weather and the climate <coughs> conditions and how they impact on what's happening inside a building and then combine all of that. And you can see at this point it starts to get quite complicated to try and fit everything onto a dashboard onto a screen. So that might have multiple pages, but at some point you want to do some analytics to be able to draw more information out. Okay. So this is where we go from descriptive analytics, saying what's happened, I'm going to graph it, I'm going to throw some statistics at it, and be able to see what's happening across um, across my operations. But on top of that, you might be able to say, okay, there's a threshold, there's, there's times where there's an alert, there's times where there, things go wrong. How do we predict when that's going to happen? Okay, we've got lots of data. If we know the patterns for an incident, which will say, mean that a piece of equipment's about to fail, and we can look through the historical data and see what that looks like, then we can be looking for that pattern of events to be able to say, okay, it's that this um, uh, this cooling fan is about to expire. Okay. And from my understanding of at the LNG plants up north, 
they have people with finely tuned hearing that go around and listen to all of those cooling fans and know what it sounds like when they're about to um, have an issue or break down. So they're putting sensors there to try and uh, do the same job without putting someone into that very noisy environment um, and very hot environment uh, to do the same uh, process. So with machine learning, instead of having to just code that up and say when you when a particular sound or a particular pattern of sounds is happening, we might have to write a program <coughs> to do that. When we're writing programs, we know what we want and go step by step and say these are the steps that it's going to take. Okay? What happens when you don't have every possible outcome in your program, you can't code for it. So with machine learning, we can be saying, I've got an algorithm that looks at all my data, looks for patterns, and classifies the output based on the historical data. Okay? So then you can be saying, I can create a model of what my system is doing. And I think there was a digital twinning presentation earlier. Creating a model of what my system is doing and then being able to say, I can explore that, or I can put that model in place and be observing and putting up alerts to say that, hey, look, there's something, this, there may be some maintenance required on this piece of equipment. So some of the applications, predictive maintenance, which is probably most applicable in this uh, audience. Looking at logistics optim optimization. So in the case where they had um, sensors and they were monitoring drivers, they could see that some drivers used less fuel than others. And by looking at what those patterns of uh, um, driving, so they might not have been accelerating as fast and not so much of a stop start, over the whole company, 15% reduction in fuel costs by coaching the drivers that use lots of fuel to drive more like the others. Um, and I mean, different applications that are perhaps in the resources industry, but together when we're, we're setting up these systems, what would normally be happening is we have our information going in and we're doing historical analysis. We've got our um, data that we are uh, presenting, but we're then having to look through reports to see what sort of things happen. It might be at the end of the year or the end of the month that you see those things. When we start to put machine learning in, we do this um, a phase of analytics on what's happening. We get those patterns and then we can have that feeding back into our operating operations of our systems. <coughs> so it adds another part to our overall environment and then creates these different roles within uh, the ecosystem. So we've got our data engineers that might have the specific skills for looking at what data you have and getting the patterns out of that, making sure that it's clean, getting it into a, a format that's able to be used by our different um, machine learning tools going through. But then as it goes through, putting training the system up, finding those patterns, Putting it out into your operating environment and then with that live system, then it's your production engineers and people that are on site that are actually part of that feedback loop to change how your system is operating. Okay. So overall, with the top image there, we have to do a lot of work in terms of looking after all of our data and making sure it's all available. So have this little bit of code in the middle that does the magic that is finding the patterns via machine learning. But a lot of people might think that machine learning is the big part of it, it's actually the small part that it's called. So we have some different frameworks, so um, depending on where your technical area is. So TensorFlow, so Google, Amazon, Microsoft have their big systems that are that they use but are also made available to um, uh, to the public. So Scikit Learn and Keras, so um, working with certain packages to extend, in this case, the Python programming language, you can use machine learning tools again. So most of these are open source and free and available to be used, so it's something that you can explore um, just using a home computer. So where we are in terms of working with the Internet of Things, working with all the sensors, is we've got a lot of data coming in, it's high volume, coming in fast, it's um, not necessarily all in a good format and it's a lot of different types of data. So 
So we do need to use the technology to um, address this challenge. So we might make sure that we use a lot of automation of getting that data in and cleaning it. Maybe reduce the amount of data just by knowing that there's a lot of data coming but we don't need all of it. So having that back. Having dashboards like the one earlier where we can display and get all of that um, information and set alarms, but also using machine learning to be able to find these patterns. So one interesting point is that a lot of these companies now, because the compute power is something that they have available um, when they need it, instead of just saying, I'm going to apply, um, use a particular model, they might say, I'm going to apply five different models and see which one performs best, or I'm going to apply 20 different models and maybe combine them so it's not, it's not just one um, classifier that we might use. So it's, a, it's a quite an interesting approach because once you have all the data available, you've done most of the work, then you can apply these different tools. So in terms of the learning, the Masters of Predictive Analytics has uh, a few streams available, but it integrates the technical skills with um, the business skills and the domain knowledge that you would already have. So one of our streams is Resource Operations Engineering, and we work with the WA School of Mines staff on that as well. So it's been um, an industry-led development in terms of the program that we have available. So uh, studying this program, you would start with the unit that I teach, fundamentals programming. So that makes sure that people coming in all get that, that first level. You don't not expected to have done programming before. But we make sure everyone gets that base level of understanding. Um, alternatively, you could be doing a statistics unit, learning about data management, data security, um, making sure that everyone's aware of what level of security and how to secure um, the data in the organisation, and then looking at the start of um, applying predictive analytics uh, mm -hmm. tools to your data. Management and organisational behaviour, uh, we actually have data structures and algorithms in there, and data mining, so looking very early into being able to have those skills and applying them to different data sets. And then in terms of the particular stream in resource of operations, um, we have strategic operations management, so understanding how the overall um, organisation works, fundamentals of the resource production industry, systems control and remote operations. So I'm not sure if you know uh, Professor Chris Aldridge, so he's been um, originally from South Africa, but this is his area of applying machine learning techniques to the resources industry, so these are units that he leads. So they're very um, specific resources units there and then an operations engineering research project to actually applying these skills um, in the field. In the second semester strategic operations management and then some recommended uh, options so artificial machine intelligence, industrial automation and robotics, wireless data networks, instrumentation and control sensor networks, so it can take you through that Internet of Things direction, working with the um, electrical engineers who are part of our school at Curtin. Okay, so it's, it is a blend of the computer science, which is my area, and the electrical engineering, and then applying it to the resources industry. So we we have the um, the academics from each of those areas as the um, delivering of those. Um, courses. So uh, Chris sent me this. This is the projects that students have been working on this semester as part of their final semester of their course. So you can see mine production scheduling with machine learning, sensor development, another one, the deep convolutional neural networks, monitoring of min mineral processing systems with deep auto encoders. Um, and that was a well that we were looking at before, reconstruction of well block responses. So looking at what information is being supplied and seen in the resources industry and then how we can connect in uh, machine learning and automation to that work. So that's the sort of thing, going back to how I started, 
the sort of thing that you could do as a project if you chose to do one of these courses, but it's also, we've got graduates coming out with the skills to have been able to do these projects, and most of them have come in with an engineering background and are putting this as the icing on the cake to their skill set. So it is, uh, we do have an intake in semester one. The master's program is two years long. If you do have an engineering background, that's a suitable qualification. Um, and then going in and doing industry sponsored projects, we work with Innovation Central, which is um, a combination of Curtin, CSIRO, Woodside, Cisco. So a partnership there where they are bringing these technologies together to solve problems. And yes, if you wanted to know more, as I said, you'd have to get back to a lecture. But there are different options. So the two-year masters, one-year grad diploma, um, one semester grad cert. And if you wanted to know more on Valerie, or you can get to Chris Aldridge directly about the resources stream.